Please join me in welcoming Mr. Brooke Morrison. Good morning. Fire safety and quality requirements. It sounds like the most boring topic you can choose for a conversation or for a presentation. And I'm sure if there was an award for this, I'd at least get a nomination for it. <laughs> but uh, why do we want to talk about quality requirements? Well, it's, it's important to our industry. It's important to the nuclear industry. It's also important to, to fire safety. So just before I start, I want to kind of put myself in perspective in this. Uh, I'm, I'm not a person with a, with a formal quality background. My background is fire safety and, uh, and engineering. That's where I come from. And, um, but I've been uh, one responsible for implementing it at our firm and it's sort of drawn into a lot of the requirements and everything. Now I'm not intending in this presentation to take you through any details of what's in the standards or anything else on quality, but I would like to talk about how quality impacts what we do and what we should be conscious of in, in trying to implement and make sure we're doing things on a quality basis uh, in the plant or, or in the facility that we're dealing with. So let's, let's charge in here and see how we make out. So why, why do we want to do quality or why does this apply to the fire or fire safety things that we do? I mean, if we're, uh, we're in engineering, we have all these standards that already tell us what we're supposed to do, supposedly. I mean, and there's, uh, there's all these building fire codes and standards on nuclear facility and fire protection. So they draw a lot of guidelines for us. For an emergency response, again, the emergency responders are fairly highly motivated to quality because it's a safety issue. I mean, fire fighting by its very activity is inherently dangerous. So nobody wants to uh, have to go tell the, the, their uh, uh, buddy on the brigade was hurt in the fire. So they're very motivated to quality and to making sure things uh, happen safely. And again, they have any number of standards here which drive and, tr and try to implement the proper levels of safety and, and all for the activities. Fire brigade, qualifications for officers, etc. So I'm going to touch just on, on quality here. There's one definition, a you know, program for systematic monitoring and evaluation of aspects of a pro, uh, project or service to ensure the standard of quality is being met. And, and quality, like, uh, like the fire industry, also is driven by uh, a lot of standards, uh, be they from the, in the nuclear regulations, the International Atomic Energy Agency, CSA, or, or ISO. They all have their quality standards. Now, these standards, like fire uh, safety standards, go through revisions and updates from time to time. And the latest updates and the latest uh, uh, pushes on, on quality are, are geared towards two things. Uh, one is that they're process-based, that you know the processes that are required for what you're doing, and that you define them carefully and you, you know what that process is. The other thing is that, and you'll hear this term quite a bit in the, with the quality groups and, the, and in the standards, is they're also risk-based. That you evaluate the risk associated with, uh, you know, executing on a process. That you know what those risks are and you take actions to mitigate and make sure that you do not um, um, create unnecessary risks uh, to the quality of the product or whatever you're doing. So those terms sort of jump jump out in the standard. So the fire safety activities uh, that we get involved in, I've broken into these four categories. Uh, design, of course we're going to design the station, there's various fire protection standards we put into place or, or processes that are taking place there. We, we have these assessments that we perform and um, they also have to follow some quality process. We have a fire protection program and then of course emergency response. So, what are the key components? And I've just selected ones here out of the standard, which, which I think we can all identify with as components in implementing quality at a plant or at a facility that we might be working at. So, first off is you have to have a defined organization. And in that organization, the roles and responsibilities within that organization must be known, and the people working in it should know their responsibilities. All gets kind of confusing if we're not. 
we must manage the information that we're using when we're doing uh, fire safety or involved in different parts of fire safety. We have to have our inputs and make sure that we know that they're accurate, particularly if we're on the engineering, but even on the emergency response when we're looking at, at, at uh, responding to hazards and doing pre plan We have accurate inputs. And then we have some process we're going to do it, but we also have to look at managing those outputs. What are we really producing as a service or as a product to the end of an engineering activity? And um, do we understand what's required in that output? Talked about it being process-based quality standards now, so, so what they're suggesting is that all work processes uh, are understood and managed, and uh, the common way that they do, uh, or the most popular, I guess, now that you see is what they call these swim lane diagrams, where any process that I have to repeat, I, I define on, the, on for each of these swim lanes, there is a, a person or position uh, identified and I have, and I show the process and who's responsible for, for uh, each part of that process so that I know it's going to be done accurately and consistently in the same way so I get a quality output. We have to apply criteria in our industry that's, uh, that's pretty clear we, we have these standards that tell us what is expected of us what we, we have to meet as far as requirements for maintaining safety or for emergency response. So these standards give us these uh, requirements. Resources. Resource management is important that we know what resources are needed to do any job or, or any process that we have, be it um, the fire hose or the equipment we're using to apply water in emergency response, uh, personal protective equipment, whether it's software, which is the upper right that we have to do to do an engineering task, and I have to have software to run that. And of course, there's the people part of it, which is the big part of it. We have the human resources that are required to execute and make that those processes happen. It's not enough just to say we're going to do something and do it consistently. We have to also document that and show that we have a, a, what the results of that are. So, it's going to be documented, somebody's going to be able to go back and take a look at that process and say, yes, I see a clear documentation that you followed those steps you said were necessary to do it in a quality fashion. So that's another key component. And then the final one we have here is, of course, that the, uh, we have to do some assessments of the processes we do just to make sure that we are doing what we said we were going to do. So those, those are sort of the components that apply to almost whatever you're doing in fire safety, these all sort of apply. So um, what I'd like to do here is spend the next, uh, the rest of this presentation is talking about these components, talking about different things we do in fire safety at a, at a facility, and uh, just show, I'm going to share some examples both from my own firm and, and, um, and from things that we see when we're doing reviews to see whether qualities, you know, are we meeting what we're, our requirements are in quality, and the other uh, I guess principle is usually involved in quality or you hear about is this constant improvement. I've got to constantly be trying to improve what I'm doing. That's why we do a lot of the things in these uh, in our programs. Fire safety, we, we tend to think if we're, we're doing uh, engineering parts of it or if we're doing fire response, gee, I, I've got a responder, therefore he can do whatever, you know, he can do all these tasks. Well, this, this is not true. I mean, when we look at doing these engineering tasks, this is just a matrix that we set up in our firm that lists some of the services and things we do in the nuclear industry and said, well, who's the one that has the qualifications to do this and who has the ability to do that in a quality fashion? And, and you, as you can see here, this is a laser um, As you can see, there are a number of things, and, and nobody, nobody has all those experiences. Nobody has all those uh, items covered. You need a team of people so that you can cover off on, on those on those various items. Quality, um, if you read a lot of quality documentation, the other terms you hear when you look at human resources is the big focus right now is on this uh, item they'll call when you're looking at human resources and you're looking at somebody doing a specific task, whether it's emergency response or it's doing some engineering or or fire program item, that they have the knowledge to con conduct that task. 
they not only have to have the knowledge to conduct that task, they must also have the competency to conduct it. And what they're requesting there and they're looking for is that you have some demonstration that they know how to apply the textbook knowledge or the classroom knowledge that they may have accumulated. It's not enough just to have the knowledge, you've got to know how to apply it. That's where they're bringing in the competency issue. And so it's good if you can doc, and in the training requirements you're looking at, then you should be able to document that both have been looked at. Now, fire, uh, uh, different fire areas of knowledge are not enough in a lot of the things we do, particularly on the engineering side. There's other members of the team here uh, from nuclear safety, you know, radiation exposure, you know, uh, probabilistic studies that Elizabeth was talking about. There's a whole different skill set again. Um, and, and we might be looking at seismic people to give us information on what happens in seismic events. So it's all about putting together a team with that background and the resources to, uh, to handle the problem. There are three uh, assessments, fire safety assessments, that take place at a power plant. There's two at least that take place at other nuclear facilities. And I just want to sort of walk through, here's the process, you hear me talking about some of the key components. So let's just talk about those as far as, as one aspect when we do these fire assessments is to look at, you know, some fire scenarios. So I'm in a process within a process here, which is another thing we, we see in, in uh, defining ourselves and how we're doing things. So let's just look at this required inputs. You remember we talked about that, the fire process, uh, some criteria and all. So let's look at this. So where's your inputs coming from? You know, so somebody has to go and get the information that's required to conduct your assessment and uh, validate that data, make sure it's available, and that everybody is using the same information. And I think that was alluded to with some of the previous speakers. We, we have this challenge here of making sure everybody's playing from the same, uh, the same score sheet here or whatever. And, uh, and then the data is common set that everybody is using and every once in a while we find people sort of wander off and get information from another source and you're saying, where did that come from, you know? But if we're going to do this consistently, we have to have uh, a, a control on those inputs. So I talked about a process within a process. You know, this fire scenario development is really this process within this um, uh, assessment process where I'm doing some screening assessment to identify what rooms I need to do fire modeling in. And then I do this uh, looking at my fire models or, or a fire scenario within a room. And it's important though to also realize where the next piece of information goes. In this case, I could be looking at, you know, I, I, I determine the fire conditions in a room. Then I have to look at how that impacts on uh, a nuclear safety or nuclear materials that might be present. And then, of course, what's the safety consequences uh, related to that? So there's a the process, I know where it stands, that's important to understand those, those, uh, those items. We look at, at um, a fire scenario, we're looking at determining criteria. So some of the criteria may be the, the, um, the level at which uh, safety systems or nuclear items are, uh, are damaged in a fire event. So these sort of criteria we apply, we do, we do some fire model and we figure out that we do have some impact. I'm going to skip over the, the resource thing. This is a documentation of outputs, and um, uh, this is a summary of the system we're using, but uh, defines the top part. With the, uh, there's a blue band, and you'll see some gray text there. That's just defining all the details of the fire scenario, and it's not very visible, but the, in that second, under the second blue band there, you'll see some little red squares. So those those are looking at the fire safe shutdown system at a power plant and uh, it shows a red square where there's a failure that would recall, cause uh, an inability to reach one of the fire safe shutdown conditions. So, so that's determining the consequences and the output of that fire modeling process. And there's our documentation to show what we've done and, and what's there. Okay, I, I want to uh, spend the, the rest of the time that to talk a little bit about process, and, and I think everybody's pretty, I mean our whole industry is driven towards these, and we have these, uh, um, we know pretty much the process of what we're doing, these criteria, we have these standards. 
But let's look at some details and say, you know, are we really capturing everything? So I've got some examples here of, of, to illustrate a couple of different points. And this is at a, at a review stage on a design. And this was uh, actually, I, I kind of made up this slide, but I, I uh, this comes out of an example, and I've lost the slide. It was on, on a slide from quite a while ago. And this is back in, in, in the U.S. when they first started, and uh, after Browns Ferry all separating redundant uh, uh, systems and everything, and there was, they found one electrical room where they had redundant switch gear uh, right next to each other. So that's what I'm trying to represent here. So the question was, though, is it needed a three-hour separation? So the question was, the opening between it wasn't very big, and they could either block it up with a block wall or put in a rolling fire door. So the question is, is, are those equal? So now I need a resource here that knows the difference between these and are they equal? Well, no, they're not. I mean, a barrier has a completely different acceptance criteria for a fire barrier test than a door does. A door is allowed to pa have passage of heat and flame where the wall is not allowed to do that. The door assumes that there's a passageway on either side. That's why it allows a little different criteria. So for the standard or to meet the intent of what the, the uh, nuclear regulations were trying to achieve, we need to put up a wall. <coughs> That's just an example of some of the things that come forward and the need for that resource that has that knowledge. Let's take another little one. I've, I've run across this on more than one occasion. I, it's been a couple of occasions that we've seen it uh, in our office. So this is all, all uh, facilities due to this management of change of CSA and, and 293 and 393 have it, and FPA 801 if you're using an FPA system. So I have to do an independent review, uh, a change and check that meets the nuclear safety and fire safety requirements. So there's this one on fire alarm and, and uh, um, the, the story here is this, uh, they were changing out the detection in a cable tunnel. And, uh, they came and said, well, here, we're replacing it with this detection system. Everything met the standard. And I was looking at this, and I said, well, this doesn't make sense. They're replacing like for like it appeared to be. So I went and talked to the designer. I said, why are you changing out the existing detection system? He said, we get too many false alarms. I said, why do you get false alarms? Have you done an investigation? Yes, we did. Why, why are you changing? Well, it's, it's too humid down there, and we keep getting this moisture, and we keep getting false alarms. And I looked at the detector that they're replacing it with, and it was a detector that was existing, and they both had the same maximum relative humidity requirement on the thing. So as a design issue, it's this environment met the standards, except it wasn't good for that environment. So there's a quality check, and I mean, the system works. I mean, we could say that that's good that it's in the standard, we have a review process and we're, we're picking up those things, but hopefully you would get it the first time. Take a look at another one. This one is kind of near and dear to my heart, but uh, is one that I think is a, a bit problematic in our industry, is water supply. So here's another example where I have a fire pump that's being uh, uh, put in a building because we couldn't achieve um, uh, minimum hose uh, pressures at the most remote hose station. So they had to they put in a new uh, power pump, and they could achieve at the uh, most remote point what the minimum pressure requirement is. Thing is, back at the source at the fire pump, our discharge pressures were quite hot. So I said, this pump feeds more than one system. So what else is on the system? Well, lo and behold, there's other sprinkler systems being fed off it. They're existing, and they're only only set up for a maximum working pressure of 150 psi. So somebody's going to do something here to fear because they're tested to 200. They're not potentially going to survive the assault that they're going to get from, from this pump kicking on and, <laughs> and operating. So again, just checks on this. We've had other water supply uh, situations. And water supply is very tricky because you're trying to solve a problem in one place and you have to make sure you don't create another problem at, a, at another location. And finally, make sure that we have documentation of what that demand is for all the systems in the plant and that our supply meets all of those requirements is, is a time-consuming task a bit, but 
it's necessary to make sure that we're going to we're going to do them properly. Uh, I think some of the previous speakers talked a little bit about this documentation and communication. It's always a challenge in a group, even when you have a common background as, as we do in fire, there's still all these challenges to communication and documentation of what we do. So I'm sharing a few uh, things that I've seen in reports and all. So here's one on a fire coming out of a fire hazard set assessment, said you know, NFPA 30 requirement site efforts as well as the WAC work type of oil temporarily stored. Now, I don't know if anybody here knows what this WAC, W-R-T type of oil is, but <laughs> I sure didn't. <laughs> and every once in a while we get working with a problem where we, we throw in our own terminology and, and uh, we know what we mean, but not everybody else reading it will necessarily know that. Here's one of a fire protect or a fire extinguisher procedure. I was uh, doing an audit once at a plant, and and I, I I'm reading through this the, these all these very boring requirements for extinguishers and testing them and checking them and everything else. And I come across this hydrostatic testing. Should we specify frequency? Is there a standard for this? So somebody had questioned that they didn't have anything for it and written it on, the, on, this, on this procedure. It had been modified and they had typed in the question. It had been reviewed by one person. It was approved by another person. And there was like four signatures on this procedure all saying, yes, we're okay with this procedure. And somebody had raised one absence in it, but it didn't get addressed. All they did was type in the question. Here's another one from a fire hazard assessment in a nuclear plant, and, and uh, this is one, again, uh, coal dust should be removed from the cable trays. Well, it's pretty hard to get coal dust in the uh, nuclear power plant. But it does highlight uh, one of the things that I know in doing reviews that we see quite a bit is, is the copy command on the computer is so efficient, I can, I can copy stuff and paste it, and then I quickly edit it. And this is just an example of, you know, and if you do it quickly, if you read through it quickly, it kind of makes sense to you, but when you look at it as a third party, you say, hold it here, is this really what you want to say? <laughs> uh, that, uh, that doesn't always come across. So I wanted to have one also, um, um, one example of communication for emergency response, and, and this, this one I, I know about it was uh, shared with me with uh, another emergency responder I thought I'd do. So this is the first uh, fire officer arriving on a, on a call. And um, here's his communication back to the, to the dispatch when he arrives. <laughs> Show small. So he said it quite fast, but, but I think he, he, he communicated the point. But, you know, it's awfully easy in the excitement and everything, and particularly in fire service, they do a lot of training on this, is how to take a couple of deep breaths, slow yourself down, make sure you're doing an effective communication of what you want to say. Um, we also do a, a, a thing internally in our, our organization where we talk about the difference between temporary and permanent communications. When you're writing engineering reports, it's a permanent communication goes on file, the plan goes to the regulator, goes to everybody, make sure you get it right. Eh? Fire ground are a little shorter uh, lifespan. Let's just talk a little bit about emergency response. This is not my, my area of expertise, although I, I was a firefighter for a, a short time and um, I enjoyed the experience a lot um, and I am aware of what some of the standards are, are requiring and it's all about uh, training. I mean one thing with emergency response is we do more training and activities to prepare for an event than we ever see events. This is a good thing, I'm not complaining about it, but it, but it is something that we have to keep drilling at because things that happen frequently are hard to prepare for. And so they do a lot of training, they do emergency pre-plans, they're doing drills, they're sharing operating experience with other, with other groups. The more realistic we can make these uh, this training to what their person's going to see, the better it is. And so these uh, most facilities, and you've heard a lot about the training grounds that uh, exist around uh, around the uh, globe. And um, there are a lot of good facilities, and no one can cover everything. The standards require that you do your uh, an audited drill every other year, 
within the facility. So we can check all the communications and everything else is necessary, but that doesn't really simulate very well these conditions that the fire and emergency responders are, uh, are facing. Um, communication is, is, of course, the biggest uh, challenge to uh, uh, not only within the crews and at the command post um, that the um, um, emergency responders are using, but and it was already referred to, uh, uh, I think, this morning. Uh, this communication also with the uh, control room is something that we had down as well as been noted. I mean, this uh, operations and how they're dealing with the operation of the plant with this uh, emergency and whether it's threatened is, is an important communication. Uh, the other issue that, that we find is this uh, hard to do in a drill, hard to cover, but this uh, we've had considerable discussions internal to our organization about um, a demonstration of sustained intervention. I mean, there's only so much time on an air bottle and, and the firefighter, the first crews go in, but can we sustain our emergency response effort and keep rotating people in and out of that to make sure that, that we're not putting anybody at risk either through fatigue or running out of air or whatever. These are all issues. Uh, I found it very interesting um, to Paul Sarah yesterday morning talking about this simulation of of um, uh, radioactive exposure and, and ex uh, acceptance of conditions that the responders are going into. So that's very good feedback. We can use that try to try to improve what we're doing. That's a quality idea. Uh, here's another kind of a share with you. I'll, I'll share with you. There's of course site condition inspections are required. They're required uh, by the standards, and uh, so we have an independent site condition inspection now. If our program is working well, you would think that we wouldn't be finding too much. But the nature of the world we live in, stuff is changing constantly. There's also things that we see that we all of a sudden realize, well, that's the way it always is. So, you know, sometimes it's accepted just because that's what we're used to seeing it. And that's why independence sometimes is helpful to come in and give some fresh eyes to it. So here's a few pictures of some stuff that we've seen or some additions that we've seen. Uh, in, the, in the course of our activity. So this is the one I like. Uh, I had a professor at university who used to talk about the little wooden wedge that people would put under fire doors, you know, and he used to call that a two-hour rated wooden wedge or door, door opener, you know. Now this is going to be a four-hour. I mean, this is a rock. I mean, this is not a <laughs> This is at a nuclear, this is at a mine, actually, a uranium mining facility. So the atmosphere in some of these areas is not all that clean. And again, things like this, the heads of their fire protection is being plugged up like that, they've got to be replaced. So everyone else will see things, but if you're looking at it every day, it gradually builds up and you just don't notice it. Ah, oh, dear, the fire department will find the hose cabinet now. <laughs> You know, again, stuff happens. Where do I put things? You know, this is always a challenge in most facilities. The space is at a limit, so hey, things get shoved in corners and everything, and uh, we end up hiding some of the fire uh, protection equipment. So that's uh, that sort of event occurs as well. Now, this on the surface looks looks pretty normal. Um, I mean, guess what? I mean, we've been pretty good with computers now, so we don't print out stuff nearly as much as we used to. So IT department had all these printers that were uh, being decommissioned and they uh, were looking for a place to store it and found some square footage to store it in. And it happens that this is at the back of one of the control equipment rooms at a power plant. Now again, our transient controls, since this is, a, this is of course a high risk area, we don't want to be, uh, be having hazards in there. So it's just one of these things. Hey, why here? Hey, well, let's get it out of there. And, and not have that uh, in, a, in a high hazard area or where it could have impacts to nuclear safety. So it's funny the stuff you see, and it's, and, but that's, as I say, it's a complicated uh, uh, thing with fire safety and trying to maintain fire safety. Uh, there's a lot of people doing things, they don't understand the world we live in, and uh, we have to kind of help them understand. So, in conclusion, what I, I just want to touch on here is this. Right now, I mean, we're sort of in a funny age. I mean, 
time is, is uh, everybody's got used to getting things in um, um, yesterday. They want this instant uh, feedback from the computer or they, they want to be able to push something and get it. Uh, there's a pressure on the, on the money to, uh, to, that's available to do things. And, and these two pressures on managing and managing fire safety are, are a bit of a challenge. You know, and this is how do we deal with this? Well, my, my point here is, uh, is whether we're doing a, a uranium mine, uranium processing, or, or power plant, these, these key components of having a quality and having a program where you have worked out what your uh, organization is, what your information requirements are in your work processes, and having the resources to do it is key to being able to meet those time and, and dollar crunches that everybody's under to get it done quickly and, and accurately and make sure that we're, we're meeting the performance requirements that are demanded of, of our industry, which are hot. We must be able to demonstrate that we're keeping the plant safe. So quality programs help us, or those quality principles help us to kind of work ourselves so that we are organizing ourselves to do these things quickly and yet making sure that we don't, we don't miss things that are important to achieving overall overall safety. And I think that's just about as much as I have to say about that.